Hello, and welcome to Tidying Up the School Library with Courtney Pentland. This is a longer version of an article that was published for School Library Journal in February of 2018. Tis the season for clutter clearing. I don't know about you, but when that first whiff of warm air hits us, I get the itch to pare down the items around me and reorganize my space. While you may not suffer from that particular affliction, I know the desire to be more organized is high on many goal lists based on the numerous books, blogs, and Pinterest pins about clutter clearing and organization that are out there these days. I have not yet seen a detailed one focusing on school libraries, so hopefully the tips below can help you get your library space in shape no matter what time of year. I personally find it helpful to do this at the end of a semester or school year, but you can do so during the workday or any time when you have free blocks of time. There is no right or wrong time to start getting your space in shape to work better for you. Here are a few tips and tricks for the physical stuff in your school library. Clear clutter before you organize. This will save you an incredible amount of time and effort. Be sure to follow the tips and steps in this webinar to achieve maximum results. Schedule your plan of attack. Pick a day or time to start. Decide which areas to tackle and when. Then add them to your calendar. What gets scheduled gets done. It is also important to break down the large task of organizing the library into manageable pieces. For these purposes, your large task will be broken down into spaces in the library. The filing cabinet in your office, your desk drawers, the shelving unit behind the circulation desk, and so on. Make a list with the most time consuming or important areas in your space at the top and scale down. Your areas that will require more attention or are larger in scale need to go into time slots when you have more open time. These larger chunks of time are important. You don't want to have to stop partway through because you have classes or meetings, as this will interrupt your flow and possibly keep you from finishing. Assign smaller areas to when you have shorter blocks of time available. If you are an instant gratification person, schedule smaller tasks first. Tackle that pencil drawer in your desk that has truly become a catch-all. Go through your to-be-filed stack and sort them into a pile by topic or into toss or shred pile. A few small wins may give you the motivation to keep going and take on a larger area. If you are a go big or go home kind of person, then schedule items at the top of your list first in those larger areas. Just don't put it off too long by trying to find the perfect large block of time. A task never started is never finished. Map out what should go where. For any organizing endeavor to be helpful and long-lasting, everything needs to have a logical home. The home for items should be where you look to find them first. I know that sounds simple, but how many times do you go looking for something and realize its current residence is somewhere else entirely? If you always look in your desk for your scissors, then that is where the scissors should be kept. Also consider ease of use. If you frequently dig through a filing cabinet drawer in the back room to get extra paper for the printer, could a shelf or drawer closer by be used instead? Grouping like items together as you create your map will make finding things and knowing how many of them you have much easier. All of your backup art supplies should be in one location, instead of crayons living in this drawer, pen markers on this shelf, and construction paper in this cabinet. Your map doesn't have to be a work of art. It just needs to make sense to you. Write it out on paper. Create it using shapes in a Word document. It really doesn't matter, as long as you know where things will end up going. Also, keep your map in a spot you won't lose it. Make multiple copies or save it as a document online. You will need it throughout the process. Call for reinforcements. If clutter clearing is overwhelming or organizing is not your wheelhouse, enlist help. Ask a friend or colleague that is good at those things, you know who they are, and see if they can pop in to help. Chances are they will get a huge jolt of happiness for helping, and you will have an accountability partner to help you stay on track. 
Working with another person requires a nice balance of listening to their advice and sticking to your guns. If you truly need all 5,000 sheets of construction paper in your life because you are unsure of when you will get to buy them again, then you should keep those. Just make sure they are stored in a logical area together that won't get bleached by the sun or fluorescent lights. If you've been holding on to a giant box of staples your predecessor ordered and have not even made a dent in in the last four years because you have tons of little boxes of staples, listen when your friend counsels you to let them go. This is a true story. My former library was very well stocked with office supplies. I think they thought when they ordered one box of staples, they were getting a little box of staples and they actually ended up with one the size that you would use to restock an office supply store. It was really hard for me to let them go, but I realized that the space they were taking up could actually be used for something better. Number six, it is okay to let things go. In the world of tightening budgets, it is easy to embrace the impulse to hold on to everything just in case. But the cost to your time as you wade through things each day looking for what you need the monetary cost of buying replacement items because you can't find the one or two that you know exist somewhere in your space, and the mental cost of being surrounded by clutter and disorganization carry a heavy price as well. Just as weeding of print materials in your school library makes it easier and more enjoyable for your students to find books they want to read, weeding your supplies can make your library life more satisfying for you. It will look worse before it gets better. Any organizing project makes your space look like your cabinets, drawers, and shelves exploded. This is totally normal. You must go through this rough bit to get to the clouds clearing, sun shining moment when you can do jazz hands and shout, ta-da! This is also why you schedule larger chunks of time for your larger, needier areas. You don't want to have to stop partway through at the mid-project disaster-looking stage. A space more chaotic than when you started can be discouraging to come back to, and it may be difficult to get your groove back as you decide where to start first with this bigger mess in front of you. Also, let go of the idea that this will be the perfect space. It doesn't have to be magazine-worthy. It just needs to be visually appealing to your eye to eliminate the clutter overwhelm and organize so that you can easily find what you need. A few steps to tackle your physical clutter. First, step one, don't buy organization items just yet. This will save you time and money. Plus, you may end up needing less than you think once you've clutter cleared, or you may even find some free tools hanging around in your space that you can use. Step two, tackle one area at a time. As stated earlier, it is much better to go one space at a time. It is very easy to wander from space to space, space to space as you happen upon items that belong elsewhere and not get anything truly accomplished. If your goal is to tackle the shelves in your office space, then that is your focus. If you encounter items on the shelves that belong somewhere else, then put them in a pile or a box to be handled when you get to their designated space. Use the map you created earlier to determine what belongs where. Step three, empty the area of all its contents. You will need to maybe adjust your plan for the time you have available and the open space that you have to sort through items. Your office may only have so much floor or counter space with which to work. This may mean that instead of doing the whole file cabinet at once, you focus on one drawer at a time. Or instead of an entire wall unit of shelving, it may be one section or shelf. No matter the area, make for sure the first thing you do when you begin is to clear it out entirely. Emptying a space allows you to see all of what has been stored there and start with a clean slate when you begin to add things back into the space. It doesn't have to spark joy, but it should have purpose. You do not have to Marie Kondo your items, but you do need to evaluate their worth. 
I'm guessing many of, many of the items you are sorting don't bring you joy, but they can either weigh you down or lift you up. As you go through the items from your chosen area, decide the purpose they serve. Do you have folders of printed lesson plans that are saved online? What purpose do these printouts serve? Are they there in case of a technology fail? Are they there because once upon a time you taught them and you don't want to waste paper? If you no longer need them, don't let them crowd your physical space. Recycle or reuse the paper if you can. Do you have a box of broken crayons for the same reason? They were once useful and you have trouble getting rid of something that once had use or might be used again one day. Have you had a fun project in mind for the past few years to use these remnants, but it has never come to fruition? Either put the project in your upcoming lesson plans or say goodbye to the crayons. Truly evaluate why each item is there and the purpose it serves. But don't spend more than 20 seconds on each item. It is incredibly easy to dither and second guess if you take too much time. Go with your gut instinct. Then sort into one of the following areas. Use, donate, recycle, dispose. If you decide this item will be used, then sort it to go into the spot designated on your map. If you know you won't use it, but someone else might, then put it in a donate pile. If it won't be used, is broken, etc., then put it in a recycle or dispose pile or box. Once you have sorted the items in each area into your use, donate, recycle, and dispose of piles, move the things that you are not keeping to a designated area that is out of the way, if possible. Take the items you plan to keep, but are not to be located in that particular space, and put them in or near the designated spot until you get to that area identified on the map. Once everything in all spaces are where they belong, according to your map, evaluate your original blueprint. Your pre-purge plan may need adjusted now that you truly have assessed your space. You may have budgeted four shelves for art supplies, but you really only now need three. Or maybe you thought you needed two sets of upper cabinets for your maker materials, but then you discovered you had more than you realized and truly need three or four sets. You're all good. This is part of the process. Your beginning map is meant to give you focus, not to be written in stone. Adjust your map and your areas as needed. It's almost time to get the to the boxes, buckets, and bins. But before you spend any money, look around and see what you already have on hand. Are there bins you emptied of items that were sent to the donate, recycle, or dispose pile that you can use for other things? Do you have a perfectly sized cardboard box to fit all of your mending supplies? Once you determine what you have, now you can decide what you need. Come up with an ideal plan. If you had the budget, what would be the best storage solutions for what's left? No budget to buy storage containers? That's okay. See if your PTA would be willing to donate some money to your cause, or see if any parents or staff members have items hanging around at home that might fit the needs of your library that they would be willing to donate. Remember, this doesn't have to be picture perfect. It just needs to be functional. In my experience, the plastic shoe boxes that can be used cheap as like a dollar a piece are really good bargain ways to store items. Plus, they're generally clear, so it's easy to see what's stored inside. Labels. Don't spend oodles of time making fancy labels. While I love a pretty label, at the end of the day, labels have a function. I find them endlessly helpful to remind us to put things back where they belong or to help people locate items when they're needed. Again, function is the name of the game. Plus, chances are you will have to revise them over time as your space adapts and changes, so the easier to create, the better. I have found that the labels you put in your printer that are about the size of a name tag work really well. They're big enough to be seen, but small enough that you can still see into those clear plastic shoe boxes. Or, if you happen to come across a stack of sticky name tags lying around in your pile of discards, you could give them a new purpose as labels in your space. All right, we're ready to do the donate, 
recycle, and dispose. At any point in this process after the sorting hat has done its job, you can deal with the donate, recycle, and dispose of piles. You could hold a giveaway for your fellow teachers in your building, allowing them to come pick from your donation pile. I did this several times in my library and supplied some treats to make it even more festive. It was a great way to get new people in the library and build relationships with my staff. Once the spaces are cleared and the great giveaway is over, dispose of any items not claimed and the recycle dispose of piles responsibly. Be sure to follow any guidelines from your district um, so that you can do things properly. For example, what do you do with those leftover bits of crayon we talked about earlier? You could send them off to an organization that gives them new life, like the Crayon in Initiative. Or how does your district want you to dispose of materials like old VHS tapes? Can those be recycled as well, or do they need to go to a district location for disposal? Step 10. Once the items are all in their homes and the leftover items are gone from your space, take a step back and admire your work. Seriously, bask in the glory of your accomplishment. You worked hard to make this happen, and if you honor that effort and commit to keeping it this way in the future, you're more likely to do so. Okay, a few little bonus tips here. Everything goes back to its place, every time, always. To help with this, follow the one minute rule. I first heard of this from author Gretchen Rubin, and for something so simple, it truly is powerful. If it takes less than one minute to do, do it right away. It pairs nicely with getting everything back to its home every time. Instead of putting things down where you happen to be, take 30 seconds and walk them to their actual home. When an invoice comes in from a vendor, file it immediately in the vendor file. Keeping up on one minute tasks keeps them from becoming an onslaught of overwhelm in the future. Be sure to schedule time to reset and reevaluate. Unfortunately, there isn't a done button on clutter clearing and organizing. It is an ongoing process. As such, you may want to schedule a reset time into your calendar. We all have the best intentions of maintaining our spaces, but sometimes life happens. Once a week or a month or whenever you happen to feel the need, take a plan period and walk through your space, putting anything that is out of place back where it belongs. Reevaluation is also important because you will always have new things coming into your space that will need to fit into your plan. Put them away according to your map or find a place for new items not already on the map to live. Equally important is considering things that may no longer be necessary as your and your students' needs change over time. For example, technology upgrades may make the 30 overhead projectors, two laser discs, 10 slide carousels with no slide projector, and five film strip projectors obsolete. I may or may not be speaking from personal experience with that last one. It is not just our physical spaces that may be weighing us down and in need of a little bit of attention. Our mental clutter can also be overwhelming. One of the biggest weights we can carry is our to-do list. If your to-do list is in need of a makeover, here are a few tips to try to get you back on track. Making a targeted approach to getting things done will help you keep on top of tasks and help you complete more items in a timely manner. First, create a dump list. Write everything you need to do down on one list. Don't do anything right away, but continue to add to the list as things pop into your head. Well, unless that thing is very time sensitive, then do that now. Take a few days creating your initial list to make sure you have everything covered. Dump lists can be very useful if you are just getting started, but they are also great to do at the beginning or end of a week for planning purposes. Items on your list may include things like writing a specific lesson plan, updating the school website or social media, creating a fall book order, weeding a specific section of the library, a collaborative meeting with a classroom teacher, working on a professional development presentation, watching a webinar like this, reading a professional article, or calling or emailing a vendor. Your dump list can be on physical paper or electronic. 
Either way, make sure it is in a space it won't get lost and can easily be accessed. Once you have your dump list, prioritize. Just as with your physical spaces, pick the things that must be done sooner rather than later. Write number one next to your priority items. Pick those neediest items that need to be dealt with right away. Then put a number two next to the next most needy items and so on. Schedule your tasks. Look at your plan periods and potential work days coming up. Take items off your dump list in order of priority and add them into your plan. Look at your plan periods, open times for the upcoming cycle or week. Number one items go first, number two next, and so on. Overestimate on how much time things will take. If you think it will take 15 minutes to do a task, schedule for 25. This way, if you're interrupted or it takes longer, you are still good to go. If you get done early, you can always tackle something off the list you have scheduled for the next open time. Continue to add things to your list. Keep adding things as they come up during the week and give them those designations of one, two, etc. Add those into your plan periods and make any shifts that you need to as necessary. No multitasking. Finish a task completely before moving on to the next thing, unless the next thing is an absolute emergency. Multitasking is not your friend. All it means is that you are not giving your full attention to a task. If you can focus on one thing at a time, you will get more done faster. Multitasking includes checking email and social media. So turn off your email alerts or turn down the sound on your computer so you don't hear them while you're working on your task. Do not open social media unless posting to your library school social media is the task you happen to be working on. Answering non-vital emails and checking in on social media can quickly deplete your designated task time. Evaluating and organizing a physical or mental space takes time and energy that we often feel like we just don't have in the tank. Just remember that in the long run, knowing and using the proper place for items will help you breathe freer and handle wearing your many school librarian hats easier. Managing your to-do list in a logical way will keep you from spinning your wheels or, oh goodness, forgetting an important task. Your initial investment of time and energy will come back to you with interest in the future. I hope you were able to find a few good tips or tricks to managing your physical space or your to-do list in this webinar. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me at mrspentland at gmail.com. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.